In this final lecture, we're going to describe how that Johns Hopkins experiment and that Johns Hopkins experience led gradually to the beginnings of the openings of great new vistas, including specifically the field of pediatric cardiology, which was the door that opened up into heart surgery in general. And then we'll go from heart surgery to the field that I think of as the ultimate cutting edge of modern biomedicine, which is transplantation. The beginnings of pediatric cardiology and of pediatric cardiological surgery and all heart surgery began with the so-called blue baby operation that was first done at the Johns Hopkins Hospital in the early 1940s. Blue babies had been described from time to time, really since antiquity, but the first Morgagni-like description of a blue baby, which is the clinical description followed by the autopsy, was done by a Dutch anatomist named Edward Sandefort, a Dutch anatomist named Edward Sandefort in the year 1771. He described a child who was unable to carry out any normal activities because the least exertion made him blue, his fingernails, his lips, his skin in general, and even at rest he was somewhat blue. And when he died of inability to breathe, really, and the autopsy was done by Sandefort, what he found was a very small pulmonary artery, the artery that carries blood to the lungs, and a hole in the septum, the wall between the right and the left ventricle. So as the right ventricle, the right side of the heart, was trying to pump blood to the lung, it couldn't. And so the muscle of that ventricle got thicker and thicker, pushing hard against the obstruction, and the blood would pour over into the left side of the heart. So the unoxygenated blood was getting out into the body, and therefore the patient was blue. Well, this was a matter of interest to a lot of people, but nothing really new happened until approximately 100 years later when one of the professors of pathologic anatomy at the University of Marseille, one Etienne, Louise, one Etienne Louis Fallot, described a disease that has since come to be known as Fallot's tetralogy because it has four parts to it. It has that small opening of the pulmonary artery, the outflow tract, is very small. It has the defect between the two ventricles in that wall between the two ventricles. It has that thick ventricular wall on the right side. And it also has an aorta that doesn't just come out of the left ventricle, this big vessel that brings blood to the body, but it actually overrides the right a little bit. So there's a lot of mixing of unoxygenated blood and oxygenated blood, and also the blood has difficulty getting through the constricted opening of the pulmonary artery so it doesn't get to the lungs. The result is a very crippled cyanotic or blue child. Well, hearts like these were studied once these children died because nothing really could be done for them. And a woman who was a pathological anatomist at McGill Hospital in Montreal spent essentially her life dissecting the hearts of children who had died of congenital cardiac disease. And in 1936, this woman, Maud Abbott, published a book called Atlas of Congenital Cardiac Disease, which became the Bible for anyone trying to study this series of diseases with any hope whatsoever of, in the future, figuring out a way to solve the problem. And the problem was eventually stalled. And the problem was eventually solved, or at least a beginning to the solution was found by yet another woman, Helen Tassig, who is the subject, really, of this lecture. And interestingly, she used those very same hearts at McGill and that very same book to get herself started in understanding what she was doing. Helen Tassie was born in Boston. Her father was a professor of economics at Harvard. And when she, in high school and in college, showed some increasing interest in becoming a doctor, he said, oh, no, 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 women don't do that kind of thing. 
you should get a degree in public health if you're interested in medicine. And she said, thanks, Dad, but that's not what I'm going to do. So when she finished her liberal arts course in college, which was Radcliffe, she enrolled in Boston University, where she took courses in anatomy and in physiology, chemistry, things like this, to prepare herself. And she also got herself a job in the BU, Boston University, cardiac clinic. It was a sort of a secretarial job, but she was watching the doctors and kind of getting an idea about how they dealt with the difficult cardiac patients that they had, whether adult or children. So she gets into Hopkins, and she graduates in 1923. There were 70, there were 70 people in her class. She was one of 10 women. Takes a fellowship in cardiology, and Edwards Park, who's the new professor of pediatrics, just brought down from Yale, suggests to her that she take a real internship in pediatrics, and for a year and a half she does that. When she gets through, they need a physician-in-chief of the pediatric cardiac clinic. There isn't a lot that can be done for the kids, and she knows as much about children and hearts as anybody, so they put this young woman in charge of the pediatric cardiology clinic in what's called the Harriet Lane Home, the pediatric division of Hopkins. And they give her a technician who also has to serve as a secretary. They give her a social worker to help her, because obviously it's very important to give aid to these families. They give her an electric cardiogram, and they give her a fluoroscope, and they give her a budget of $4,000, out of which she has to take her own salary. So there she is. And most of the kids she's seeing have the residua of rheumatic fever, disease of the valves, scarred valves, but she's seeing a sufficient number of kids with congenital heart disease, heart disease they're born with, very often so-called cyanotic or blue baby disease, and she gets more and more interested in them. She has a bit of a problem physically. She's a little deaf, doesn't hear very well. So she refines her ability to use the stethoscope, just works at it, but she refines something else, which is her ability to feel a chest wall, put a hand on a chest wall, and tell by the pulsations which ventricle is larger or the action that it is taking in trying to press out the blood. She can feel what are called thrills, which is the vibration that is manifested through your ear by a murmur. And she also begins using that fluoroscope in ways that no one has ever used it before. She turns the kids from side to side, flips them around so that she's seeing the two atria, the two ventricles from different perspectives, and she gets very, very, very good at diagnosing these congenital heart diseases. Well, at that point, there had been nothing that you can call cardiac surgery. There had been two operations that had been done a few times. One was called a coarctation of the aorta. Some children are born with an aorta which is narrowed up in the chest, and several surgeons had learned to cut out that narrowed part and bring the edges together and allow a child to survive and lead a healthy life. And the other operation that had been done in a number of instances was the division or the suture of what was called a patent or persistent ductus arteriosus. In embryological life, the blood is shunted past the lungs because your lungs are not functioning. So the blood goes out the pulmonary artery and there's an opening, a passageway, like a duct, into the aorta to allow that blood to keep on flowing. But the moment a child is born, that ductus, that passageway, just closes. But occasionally, the passageway does not close. And of course, the pressure relationships have changed. So now the aortic blood is pouring into the pulmonary artery, and the lungs are infiltrated with too much blood. So the operation you do to keep the child from going into severe pulmonary failure, lung failure, is to divide that ductus, and then the kid's completely normal. Well, when she looked at her kids, she would sometimes see children who had both the tetralogy 
both the tetralogy of Fallot and the patent ductus, because if you have one congenital anomaly, it's likely you're going to have others. So she would see a kid from time to time who had a tetralogy, who had trouble, of course, oxygenating his or her blood, and who had a ductus, and because the child had the ductus, they weren't nearly as cyanotic because blood was going through the ductus from the aorta into the lungs. Even though that pulmonary outflow tract was tight, the blood was bypassing that tightness and going right into the lungs. So the more she thought about this, she said, I've got a great idea to treat tetralogy of Fallot. We'll just build a ductus. She had no idea, of course, how you could do that technically, so she went to the chief of surgery at the Johns Hopkins Hospital, a uh, fellow whose name was Alfred Blaylock, who had uh, come up initially from Culloden, Georgia, to work at Vanderbilt Hospital, where he'd been professor of surgery. He'd done some interesting work on shock, surgical shock, what happens when the blood volume is lost, and on what's called pulmonary hypertension, on high blood pressure in the lungs. And the way he created experimental animals who had high blood pressure in the lungs was to build a ductus, essentially. He hooked up the aorta to the pulmonary artery so that these animals, the blood pours out into the aorta and then whoosh, zips right over into the lungs. So he had this great experimental animal on which to study pulmonary hypertension. But he had something even better than that. He had the world's best technical assistant. He had a young man who had come to him initially at the age of 19, whose name was Vivian Thomas. Vivian Thomas was an African-American man who had wanted to go to medical school, but couldn't even afford to go to college. So he got a job as a technician at Vanderbilt, and he had good hands. He had wonderful hands. And bit by bit over the years, Blaylock had put him in charge of developing the technical aspects of some of the experiments that he was working on. So all of these ductuses that were being built to study pulmonary hypertension were being built by Vivian Thomas. In fact, although Blaylock did spend some time in the lab, he entrusted just about everything to Vivian Thomas. So Helen Taussig comes to talk to Blaylock. Blaylock knows perfectly well that if something technical has to be done, he's going to have Vivian Thomas there with him. So they're sitting there and they're talking about this, and Dr. Taussig says, well, you know, Dr. Blaylock, they always had this kind of cool relationship. As you can imagine, a cardiac surgeon and a pediatrician, they're going to have a cool relationship. So she says, we, we really have to build a ductus. And after she leaves, both Thomas and Blaylock realize this is how to do it. We're going to do it the same way we did it with our pulmonary hypertension experiments. And the way we're going to hook up the aorta to the pulmonary artery is not going to be quite the way Dr. Taussig thought, because it's really hard to take these two big vessels and make a hole between them and then you know, sew around the hole and keep it in place. We're going to take the subclavian artery, the artery that goes to the arm, and we're just going to divide it tie the peripheral end, and then take it down and hook it right into the pulmonary artery. So the blood will go out the aorta into the subclavian artery and then into the pulmonary, and that'll bypass this obstructed pulmonary artery. And Vivian and he agree, and Vivian goes to the lab, and he starts operating on dogs, and he operates on one dog, and then another dog. He, ev he eventually ends up operating on 200 dogs, and he's picking the smallest dogs he can find because he knows that when the time comes and they have to do the surgery on a real child, it'll be a pretty small child. But he hadn't counted on how small that child would be. Because one day, when they're still not ready to take this out of the lab and into the operating room, in late November of 1944, Helen Tassie comes to Dr. Blaylock and she says, Dr. Blaylock, I have a child here who's 11 months old who's going to be dead in a couple of weeks with tetralogy. We've got to do your operation. We must do it. Blaylock says, we can't do it. We're just not ready. I haven't even done one in the lab yet. 
She says, I'm terribly sorry, it has to be done. And he says, okay, this little child, Eileen Saxon, will be the very first child. So here she is, nine and a half pounds, tiny, little, wizen kid, just as blue as the inside of your pocket. They brought her into the operating room, and I have this firsthand because the pediatric cardiac fellow in that room was Ruth Whittemore, who was my teacher at the Yale Medical School. They brought this child into the room. They laid her down on the operating table. Blaylock scrubbed up, started working with his two assistants. One was William Longmire, who was the resident. He went on to become chief of surgery in the University of California system. The intern was a tall, thin fellow named Denton Cooley, who went on to become one of the great men at the Texas Heart Institute, one of the great contributors to cardiac surgery. And they began operating. But there was another member of the team. Blaylock insisted that Vivian Thomas be present in the room. So Vivian Thomas pulled a stool up behind Blaylock, he's a tall, skinny guy, leaned over Blaylock's shoulder and watched as the stitches were put into this anastomosis, this new hookup. It was the first time Blaylock had ever done it. And sometimes he put the stitches in wrong. And Thomas would say, no, Dr. Blaylock, you have to do it this way. Oh, Dr. Blaylock, or Dr. Blaylock would turn around and say, Vivian, what do you think of this? So Vivian was really supervising Blaylock's operation. That child lived. That child lived and became pink. Everybody was very excited about it, and they were encouraged. The next two patients were a little older and significantly larger. In fact, they were a lot older. One was 12, one was 6. The operation was on the map. Of course, from the city of Baltimore, more patients came, and then from all of Maryland, and then from all of the eastern seaboard, and then from all the United States, and in time from all over the world. And they were so busy they could hardly keep up in the pediatric clinic with all of the patients that had to be carefully handpicked to be sure that they were either so sick or they would die without it, or they were yet not so sick that it was not justified to take this risk. So by November of 45, which was only one year after they started, they had operated on 55 patients. And as time went on, they reached a point where the mortality, which had started out as something like 20%, was down to less than 5%. It's an amazing thing. The first real cardiac operation. And it not only meant, of course, that so many of these children would be saved, but it meant that manipulating the tissues, the great vessels around the heart, and perhaps the heart itself, was something that could safely be done. And this encouraged surgeons to try operations within the heart. The early operations for so-called mitral stenosis, the tightening of the valve between the left atrium and the left ventricle were carried out by a surgeon putting a finger into the heart and cracking the tightened scarred valve opened. These were the operations that were being done during my student days and my training days. I used to do them myself. Nowadays, of course, these kinds of things are done with open heart surgery. The valves are replaced. But this gives you some idea of the primitive approaches, but they were encouraged by the fact that Taussig had come to Blaylock, and Blaylock had had the courage and the technical ability, thanks largely to Vivian Thomas, to go ahead and do this kind of surgery. Well, needless to say, Blaylock and Taussig made the grand tour. In 1947, they went to a number of European capitals demonstrating the operation. Taussig would go to the clinics and see these patients and pick the patients, and Blaylock, with his residents with him, would operate on them. And there are numerous wonderful stories about this tour that they made, but the real effect of the tour was to encourage new attempts at cardiac surgery of all kinds. She wrote in 1947, a book called Congenital Malformations of the Heart, Taussig did. It was the first textbook of pediatric cardiology. What that did, and what the operation did, was make that field expand so rapidly 
that a second edition would be required within a decade, and it needed two volumes, each of a thousand pages. So this had been an explosion. And of course, young, talented people came to her from everywhere, and so she trained this entire generation of this new field of pediatric cardiology. And if you were a medical student or a resident in the 1950s or early 1960s, as I was, the probability, the overwhelming probability was that your teacher of pediatric cardiology had been directly trained by the great Helen Tassig. But interestingly, she didn't make professor till 1959, you know, 15 years or so after this great contribution. So no one can say that opportunities for women were really completely equal at Hopkins, although we like to think that they are now. Now that was her greatest contribution, but it was not her only contribution. People remember her later in life when she was quite a bit older, in her 60s actually, for her effective campaign against the marketing of thalidomide in this country. You will remember this drug that was first marketed in Germany under the name of Countergen, and it was discovered later that it produced a problem called phocomelia in infants. They were born without forearm bones or with decreased length of forearm bones, and so they really didn't have arms. And she got wind of this when the S. Merrill Company filed a new drug application with the FDA, and she was determined to stop it. She spent six weeks in Germany going to the clinic, speaking to doctors, came back, and with Francis Kelsey of the Food and Drug Administration, mounted this powerful campaign to stop it. And so in March of 1961, when she was 63 years old, they succeeded in stopping the new drug application. So thalidomide was not sold in this country. Helen Tausig retired at the age of 65 in 1963, and yet 41 of her 100 major publications were written after that time. She lived a very long time, and three weeks before her 88th birthday, she was backing out of the driveway in the community for the elderly where she lived. She was going to vote in the primary and she never had been able to hear traffic very well, and somebody hit her, and she was killed, just, as I say, a few weeks before her 88th birthday. But this is what started cardiac surgery, and this is what led eventually to cardiac transplantation, and transplantation then of other organs. The open heart machines, cart, the open heart machines, heart-lung machines, came into being in the mid-1950s, which made all sorts of manipulations possible, including eventually removing a heart and putting another heart into its place while the heart-lung machine was bubbling away and doing what the heart and lungs ordinarily do. The story of cardiac transplantation is really the story of our evolving understanding that the cells of each of us harbor within them something that is theirs alone, something that is unique to us, that is called the notion of self. My self is different from any other self antigenically, immunologically, except the self of my identical twin, if I happened to have one. So the story of transplantation becomes the story of scientists' increasing ability to handle the problem of rejection, because somebody else's self is coming into me if I've got his heart, and I'm going to make what are called antibodies, agents, molecules, to kick that out of me. And so what we have is the campaign in centers all over the world to develop agents that slow, that so inhibit agents that so inhibit the immune response that you can take someone else's organ and put it into me or put it into someone or put it into some third party and that organ will be accepted and it's been done with a number of drugs. Steroids are part of it, but the mainstay in recent years, actually since the 1970s, has been this drug cyclosporine which is a fungus-based drug that was originally dug up on a field trip by a Swiss scientist who was looking for antibiotics. And it turned out that he 
ended up with cyclosporine. Well, so what did surgeons do with all this information? Well, they jumped the gun, as surgeons are prone to do, before they were even ready to understand the immunological response that happens with a donor heart and a recipient. On December 3rd, 1967, Christian Barnard of Grotesure Hospital in Cape Town, South Africa, took it upon himself to do a cardiac transplantation. He was going to be the first one. He had trained at Stanford University on the service of Dr. Norman Shumway, who was the chief of that cardiac service. He'd worked with another very bright young cardiac surgeon named Richard Lauer. Shumway didn't feel that he was ready. He didn't understand enough about the rejection phenomena. But Barnard decided he would do it. And he did. He operated on a man named Louis Washkansky. He replaced his heart with the heart of a young woman who had been killed in an automobile accident at this hospital, and Washkansky lived 18 days. Instead of discouraging Barnard, that encouraged him because the Washkansky family had been so cooperative and so grateful for this effort that he tried again, and on January 2nd of 1968, he operated on a dentist whose name was Philip Blayberg, and Blayberg lived 19 months. Well, here's Shumway, all the way on the other side of the world, in Palo Alto, California, and saying, this guy's my student, and he is doing transplants, and although it's only a few days after he's operated on Blayberg, Blayberg looks terrific, why don't I do it? So he operated on a patient, transplanted a heart, and his patient lived only 15 days. But he wasn't discouraged. He kept at it. And not only did he keep at it, but far less qualified people decided to jump on this bandwagon. And all over the country and all over the world, hearts were being transplanted and patients were dying. They were dying because the rejection phenomenon wasn't understood, because there were no proper agents to decrease this immunological response. And in 15 months, 118 people had their hearts transplanted into a recipient. Every one of those recipients died. This was 18 countries. By late 1971, everybody but Shumway and Barnard had stopped. And soon afterwards, Shumway stopped and Barnard stopped. And Shumway continued his immunological studies, improving his technique, trying to understand the biology a little bit better. And gradually, gradually he took heart after a manner of speaking. And he began slowly to resume his work. And it was so successful that by the mid-80s, by 1984, as a matter of fact, 29 centers in the United States had done some 300 cardiac transplantations, and they kept doing more and more with these extraordinary results. So many, many people, perhaps 95% of people lived at least a year, at least 80% of people live something like five years. It's almost become a routine operation. The remaining problem with cardiac transplantation, since the immunological problem has largely been solved, is availability, which is the same problem that haunts the transplantation of all organs. But we now live in an era of molecular wonders, an era of genetic engineering, not to mention the promise of the almost unending potentiality of what we may be able to do with stem cells in the future. Who knows what the next discoveries will be? And who knows what sorts of men and women will make them? Certainly, they're no longer going to be individuals because the kinds of research that are being done today require large teams and cooperation between teams in different parts of the country, different parts of the world. But no matter how far medical progress eventually gets to, but no matter how far medical progress eventually goes,
it will always be in debt to the pioneers of its first two millennia, whom we have been discussing in these past 12 lectures. And in their lives, there will always be lessons to learn about the process of discovery.